Welcome everyone. This is uh, Candidates Discuss with Athens for Everyone. My name is Erin Stacer. I'm the current president of Athens for Everyone and we are joined today by our esteemed panel. Uh, many candidates, awesome candidates running for various offices. Um, and we actually like to start these off usually with the candidates introducing themselves. <laughs> today we'll be talking about immigration and let's see who's going to be the first one to talk. Um, let's go with uh, Jesse Hool. Well, okay. Hey y'all, I'm Jesse Hool. I am simultaneously in this bizarre situation of being commissioner elect and candidate for district six of Clark County's commission districts. That's basically West Athens. And our election will be all the way at the end of your ballot if you live in District 6, just before the amendment question. So please vote all the way down ballot for these fantastic folks, right on down to our special election. I'm going to kick it over to Zach. All right. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Zachary Perry. I'm the Democratic nominee for Georgia State Senate District 46, which covers most of Athens, all of Oconee, and most of Walton County. Um, I am the son of an immigrant. My mom is from Venezuela. So I'm really excited to talk about this. Um, I think most people, when they think of immigration issues, they justifiably really focus on the federal level. But I think even down to state and local levels, there are some very important things that all levels of government can do to um, really take advantage of the wealth that immigrants bring to communities. Awesome. Uh, Devin. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Devin Pandy. I am the Democratic nominee for uh, Georgia's 9th Congressional District here in Northeast Georgia. We are the 20 counties uh, in the Northeast corner of Georgia. <clears throat> and uh, I really enjoyed the conversation we had a couple of days ago. I'm really looking forward to this. I learned a lot. I was able to express a lot. And um, I'll tell you, uh, Jesse Hull and Richard Dean Winfield, uh, they, they have a lot of knowledge in their noggins, and I am here to soak it all up. And um, I know you've seen um, uh, Zachary Perry uh, doing his thing. And, um, and I just want to let everyone know, I meant to say this before we started recording, but Deborah Gonzalez, just all of the things that you do in the community. Oh my gosh, you're such an inspiration. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know you and I love you. You're awesome. <laughs> So I'm going to take that as you passing it to me. How's that, Devin? <laughs> That'll work. <Yeah. laughs> well, good evening, everybody. I'm Deborah Gonzalez. I was the former state representative for House District 117. So now I'm going to ask you, please vote for Mocha Jasmine Johnson. Okay, for that seat. Um, and now I am running for District Attorney of the Western Judicial Circuit, which includes uh, all of Athens Clark and all of Oconee counties. Uh, I am running on a criminal justice reform platform, basically saying that what we've had the status quo for the past 48 years is not doing it. It's not cutting it for our community. We need so much more. And so I am asking people to vote for me, to vote for change as we go forward. And Devin, I'm so glad that you're here. Our, our roads have crossed, right? Very briefly. So it's nice to have this time with you. And I loved hearing the story of your beard. So thank you for being here. It's, it just shows the kind of person that you really are. So I hope uh, people and voters get to hear that because I think it says a lot about who you are and how you would be as a congressman. And that's really, really important. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you. You never, I, 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 I'm, I'm so used to um, talking about other people and, and, and acknowledging them. I never really think about how my stories um, impact people. So thank you for bringing that up because yeah, I, I need to tell that story. Thank you. Okay, and I'll pass it to Richard and then you <laughs> got to tell the story. Somehow we're going to get it in here, okay? Okay. <laughs> I want to thank all my <clears throat> compatriots uh, for their kind and inspiring words throughout our discussions. Uh, I'm running for the U.S. Senate in the special election. I'm the last of the 20 one candidates on the ballot. And I just want to alert you all, there is no spoiler danger because the Democrat who is most awash with money is polling above 40%. All you need is 23% to get to the runoff. So you can on a good conscience vote for the candidate who 
with the platform you most identify with and send a message to our next administration. And uh, I invite you to check out my, my platform, a job guarantee social rights agenda. I am a grandson of immigrants from somewhere or other in Eastern Europe. Some parts are completely unknown to me. Uh, I married a woman who is an immigrant from India. Somehow or other, I managed to uh, get her fiance's visa as she was planning to, to make her way here despite a lot of opposition at home. And she became an immigration lawyer. And I have often accompanied her to immigration prisons in the back of the beyond in Georgia and Alabama and uh, sort of by osmosis uh, participated in, in, in the work she's doing. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested that we're talking about immigration topics today. Talk about a great story. Awesome. So um, there's your panel for today, everybody. And um, let's delve into it. Does anybody want to start us off talking about, I mean, each one of you seems to have some familiarity, if not personal experience um, to, to immigration. So if anybody uh, feels compelled to begin. So I can begin a little. This is something that's um, close to me. One, because I identify as Latina. And unfortunately in Georgia, when we talk about immigration, it's usually a Latino face that you see. Although the truth is that, you know, we have immigrants from all over the world. And if you ever get a chance to visit Clarkston, Georgia, which is one of the most diverse places because it is a refugee settlement area um, in there. And so Ted Terry used to be the mayor there. Um, and it, it's just a wonderful place to visit and to see the diversity of, of, of the world, but also the reason why immigrants come to America, you know, and why they've been coming for years and, and centuries, really, of being here, of looking for that, that promise that if I work hard enough, that if I do what I need to do, I can actually make my life better um, for me and my family and generations after me. And, you know, what, what I've been advocating or for is what I advocate for in everything. It's the idea of treating people with dignity and respect, right? And, and acknowledging that they are human beings who are um, struggling and in pain. And we have an administration that has become so cruel and so punitive in the way that they treat these people from putting children in cages, from separating families to forced hysterectomies in detention centers, you know, and it, it does become an issue in politics. When I hear a sheriff candidate talking about even, even just teasing that he wants to engage in 287G and an agreement with ICE and knowing what that means to the immigrant community, knowing the fear that that brings to them, um, is it just makes me say, absolutely not. I would never vote for that individual. Um, and if he says, you know, how much he knows about the community, obviously he doesn't uh, because that's not what the community wants. And I think the community was very straightforward, right? When they voted in a new democratic nominee for sheriff who was very clear that he was not going to go there with 287G. And so we've had John Q. Williams here before. And so a shout out to him as well. Um, but it is one of the things that I appreciate. And, you know, people will say, well, wait a minute, you're running for DA. What, do, what does that have to do with immigration? Well, people don't understand when the DA makes a decision to give an individual a certain charge. At some levels, those decisions actually affect the immigration status of individuals. It could lead to them being deported. It could lead to them being be put into detention. It could eliminate the opportunities of seeking asylum or even getting through their citizenship process simply because of the type of charge that is made against them. And when we have the problem of over prosecution of piling charges on individual that then, you know, after a few months or a year, they all of a sudden magically come down to a misdemeanor that would not have affected their immigration status before, but because they started off so high, 
it does affect them. And then it has ramifications within that person's life, within that person's family, within the community that that person comes from. And so it does very much um, get affected by decisions made in the DA's office. And so there are progressive DAs that I follow, such as Larry Kasner in Philadelphia, you know, who have made it part of their policy to that this is something that you evaluate, that you consider a person's immigration status before you make those charges. Because if you're gonna do a higher status that has that added consequence, you better make sure that you can prove it. You better make sure that you're not gonna plead it down later on because you've put that person and that family and that community at risk when you didn't have to, right? Um, and so I'll, I'll stop there for now, thanks. I'll, I'll jump in if I can, because I just want to frame our discussion a little bit, because there are two sides to immigration that, that we've got to recognize. One has to do with um, the policies with regard to what kind of immigration um, is being permitted. And the other has to do with naturalization. Now, when our, our republic was set up, there were no restrictions on immigration. We, in effect, had open borders. And we had that for about 100 years. We did, however, have very restrictive naturalization policies. And the first naturalization law was in 1790. And it basically allowed only white individuals of proper moral standing to become citizens. Everyone else was excluded. Now things gradually loosened up to some degree and extended who could become naturalized. But what really was a turning point was the 14th Amendment, which established that anyone who was born in the United States or naturalized um, was a citizen with full rights. So that part of the population or the, the, that part of the leadership that wanted the population to have a certain ethnic or racial contour now would have to make use of restrictions on immigration to perpetuate that. So after the 14th Amendment, we had the first immigration laws that restricted who could immigrate. And you know, they were restrictive in various ways. Uh, you have the Chinese exclusion laws in some respect that well, pertain to uh, naturalization, but also at a certain point to immigration, various populations were kept out from coming into the United States. It really wasn't until Lyndon Johnson in 1965 that you had an immigration act that more or less kept at bay the kind of racial, uh, the racial specifications uh, that were intended to perpetuate a certain kind of white superiority. These were removed. Uh, there was a compromise, by the way, and I'll just mention. And that was, it was agreed that one of the considerations in our immigration policy would be what uh, Trump calls, um, what is it, chain migration, or what we could call family reunification. Because the idea of the people who put it into that 1865 law that more or less burst open the restrictions on who could come to the United States uh, within our immigration uh, uh, quotas. Uh, there was going to be a, a lot of room for family members, relatives to come. And the thought was that that would perpetuate the given ethnic profile of the United States, but it didn't turn out that way because much less of the, let's say white European population had relatives who wanted to come to the United States. And as a result, from, eight, from 1965 onwards, the people immigrating into the United States um, had a very different ethnic and racial profile than before. Um, I just want to mention that, you know, we want to consider all these things as we proceed. All right, I guess I can, uh, I can go next. I'll, I'd like to give <clears throat> a little um, background of, of myself. And then I'd like to talk about um, something that I I'm specifically interested in when it comes to immigration. So I, growing up, never felt like I belonged anywhere. And that's probably why I'm so, um, so quick to adapt to wherever I am now, because I had to learn how to do that as a child. So as a child, I wasn't dark enough to be considered really Black. 
I obviously am too dark to be white. Um, I'm from Belize. I was born in Belize, came here um, when I was an infant, but, uh, but I don't speak Spanish. So I didn't belong with the Latinos. And, um, and my parents speak, so in Belize, they speak what we call Creole, which is different from Creole. Creole is derivative of French. Creole is derivative of English. And them song like, um, like them Jamaican, you know? And so, but I didn't, I didn't speak that but my parents did. And so this is the early 80s and um, Bob Marley is, is worldwide, but he's not as popular back then as he is now, not as accepted, you know, reggae wasn't a big thing back then. And so not only did I not fit in with the white people or the black people or, or the Latinos, but, um, but they would hear my parents speak, my, my friends would hear my parents speak or hear the music coming out of our house and uh, and I didn't fit in that way, so um, so it's it's beautiful to me to be able to actually um, have and, and I have all of those things in me. You know, I I, I am Latino. I am um, of of African descent. I am uh, of Dutch descent. Uh, so I, I have all of those things in me, and. Uh, and so it's what it's beautiful to me now that I'm able to to be a part of all of these things that are a part of me. I, I love that. Um, so I just wanted to uh, explain that part of of my um, of my history. But then I wanted to talk about um, those those people who have served our country not only served in our military, but have actually deployed to war zones. <clears throat> and then when they come back, they're deported. And it's, it's amazing to me because they're not allowed to be here anymore. Even though they serve this country, they risk their lives. And, um, and some of them, you know, some people didn't come back from those wars, you know, they actually paid with their lives. But these people have risked their lives. Now we have discarded them. We've used them. We don't need them anymore. We've discarded them. And you know that a lot of times the only way for them to get back to this country is to die because they're still allowed a military funeral. And so they die, they get a casket draped with the flag and they get to come back here and be buried. But they're not good enough to stay in this country after they fought for us. And that really, really enrages me. It really does. And I'm a pretty laid back guy. I don't really get worked up about much, but that just is, it's horrible to me. It's horrible. So Devin, if, if I can just address that, I am, you know, my background is my father was in the army. So I am a military brat. Right, I'm one of those kids that moved every two years. Um, and the military is something that's very, very close to my heart. And there is this Netflix um, series called Immigration Nation. And if any of you have not seen it, I highly recommend it. However, I will tell you that the first episode is really difficult. It took me three times to get through it and I cried the entire length of that first episode. But one of the stories that that series gets into are those military soldiers who are deported back, right? And, and it talks about from their point of view, the sacrifices that they gave for this country. And what, what really stuck with me was that each and every single one of them did not regret their service and that they would go and serve again for this country to protect this country, even though the country was kicking them out. And that to me was just, you know, wow, you're being thrown out by the people that you are willing to risk your life for. They are destroying your family. And, and so it was just, um, but it's called Immigration Nation. 
It's a four part series on Netflix. Um, but it is, I, I will warn you, it is very, very difficult to watch, but it does follow some of those military people. So Devin, you might want to take a look. Well, I will definitely, I wrote it down and I will definitely take a look at that. And I'm, I'm glad that it's difficult to watch because that tells me that they're probably getting into the real nitty gritty of, of what is going on. And I think that that's a problem with, with, uh, with us as a country trying to to tackle these issues is that they're difficult issues. We're talking about race, we're talking about hate, we're talking about slavery, we're talking about discarding of human beings. So yeah, it's difficult. But if you can make it through that difficulty, that's when we can actually make change to uh, when we can reach an understanding to be able to make change. And I think that the people who really need to watch that are the people who who think, well, I don't care if they served our country, they're not citizens, they need to go home. Maybe that will change their minds. I'd be curious to hear more thoughts from Jesse and Zach real quick. Yeah. And maybe we can get to this um, comment mm -hmm. from our audience. Um, but to what Devin was just saying, I think, uh, especially the specific topic, topic is emblematic of a lot of issues with our immigration system, that if you actually explain the way that it works to people, and you say, hey, this is this weird thing that happens in our immigration system. Everyone or most people agree that's wrong. That's not OK. Um, so I mentioned earlier, I'm the son of an immigrant. Um, my mom's green card and driver's license happened to she had the good luck of them expiring while everything was shut down. Um, so for the past couple of weeks, you know, I've been very, kind of very nervous, um, but even though she's lived here for 35 years um, and should have nothing to worry about has paid taxes. She's a small business owner in town, but because of the current environment, I'm nervous. Um, but last year I worked at a clinic at UGA Law as well, and I was helping with U visas. And another kind of example of a system that is, doesn't make a lot of sense is um, there, for those of you who don't know, a U visa is if you're the victim of a particular kind of crime, um, there's a list of them. It's an extension of the Violence Against Women Act and you participate in a police investigation into that crime, you, um, it's a pathway to a green card into naturalization. The problem is that it's maxed out at 10,000 people a year. If you were to stop applications right now, it would take 10, over 10 years to clear the roles of people that are already on the waiting list for that application system. When you sell, tell that to people, everyone kind of agrees, yeah, that's a problem. Um, the reason that's a law is we want our immigrant community, community, documented and undocumented, to participate with law enforcement. And we want them to feel comfortable participating with law enforcement. Um, and so there's a litany of things that we have, we can all kind of agree this is wrong and this needs to be fixed. And unfortunately, uh, those issues are going to fall to uh, Devin and Richard if they um, are able to get elected. That's, that's all federal issues. Um, but that doesn't mean that those of us at the state and local level are powerless or can't do anything to benefit our immigrant community or make them feel more welcome or make them safer. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with sanctuary cities, uh, not participating in, not uh, cooperating with ICE investigations and ICE law enforcement. And there's a lot of information on that um, that I think would apply more to uh, Deborah and Jesse. Um, at a state level, which is where I hope to end up, it would include things like extending in-state tuition to dreamers and to students who we have paid as taxpayers, just, I mean, this is logic to me, that we've paid as taxpayers for them to be educated in our public education system. And we want them to stay in Georgia. These are incredible people who can improve our economy. We want them to stay here, but they're having to pay $40,000 or double what you would have to pay at UGA if you're in-state, even though they've lived through the whole, just about their whole lives. Another thing that I think at a state level we need to do is stop allowing and stop inviting ICE and the federal government to bring detention centers into Georgia. Um, if those of you are unaware, there is a Lumpkin County, Georgia, where there is an ICE detention center. The ICE detention center was put in the middle of nowhere in Georgia for a few reasons. Um, it gives jobs to a rural community, makes a you know, local legislator happy, um, someone probably donated a lot of money to Republicans to get it put there, 
but also has the um, benefit or the side effect of separating these immigrants from lawyers. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center actually has to have a trailer down there to house a group of lawyers because there's no other kind of infrastructure to get any kind of legal aid to these immigrants. And there's nothing that makes sense that why you would have immigrants that are seeking asylum at the southern border are then transported over to Georgia. And so that kind of thing's ridiculous. And then we're, that's not even getting into the horrendous things that are occurring at other ICE detention centers in this state, where you're having forced hysterectomies of unwilling women and who are having these dangerous operations and living in terrible conditions. And these are people who came to this country seeking asylum. They're in holding, they're, they're getting processed and we're shipping them halfway across the country and subjecting them to war crimes, to uh, crimes against humanity. And so these are the things that at a state level, you can say, no, we're not gonna allow that. The federal level, you can do actually change the immigration system. At a local level, you can say we're not going to participate and we can extend certain rights to our immigrant community. But um, I, I think the stories are really important. I just, I, I, I think there's a lot of things that need to be changed about the way we handle immigration in this country. And it's not, and I think a lot of people are hopefully, I, I like to think that we've all kind of gotten to the point where we're starting to appreciate our immigrant population more and more. Um, in spite of the rhetoric that we hear on a daily basis. Well, I jotted down some notes from y'all sharing your stories. Thanks a lot for sharing your stories. I don't really have direct ties personally in my blood or, or my personal history with um, immigrants. I, my grandparents immigrated here. Um, but uh, I think the first thing that's really important is that we recognize that we're a colonizing culture, that we, we all live on colonized land, but the people who lived here were driven out violently. Uh, and that goes all the way into war with Mexico. You know, a lot of the talk, as you pointed out, Deborah, right now about immigration is about immigration south of our border. But what that border is has changed a lot because this nation, you know, invaded and took it. Uh, and then I think from there, that sort of reveals a lot of cultural tendencies we have. Without getting too abstract, I just kind of want to point out that othering, which is a, a, a tendency we have of, of grouping ourselves and seeing people as somehow other, the way that intersects with commodifying, you know, we're this hyper commodified society, and then throwaway culture. And so if we're able to say that, well, there's this group and there's that group, and that's been happening for as long as this nation has existed, because there's always been colonizers justifying the people they're driving out or subjugating in some way. Uh, and then to turn those people into commodities, which was very obvious with slavery, but is still obvious in the ways that workers are treated today and not paid enough, or in some cases, not at all for labor they're doing. And then the way that we have these products that we think of as just being able to throw away. And there's this concept of not only other people, but other places that stuff can go. And so whether it's a landfill that we send stuff to that's somewhere else in our community or in other communities, you know, they send their garbage to other countries entirely or it's people that have been regarded as commodities and then we can somehow think of them as being able to be deported or thrown away. I think it's just a, a, a very problematic way of thinking that goes all the way back to those colonialist roots. Um, and so part of how I think we can break out of that is looking at the migration part of the word immigration. Immigration sounds very much like a system, but migration is beautiful, right? That's a, that's a, a phrase we hear a lot. And that's something that animals do naturally and I think that's something that a lot of folks who look like me and who grew up in a place like the United States that's so large are accustomed to doing without thinking about it. We have a vast expanse of land that we can move through without having to show identification or prove our worth. And that's just not the case for most people in the world. Um, and you know, I think it's also important to think that the other people in the world, you know, we, we think of ourselves as a democratic society, other people in the world that we affect don't get a vote in what we do. People in Iraq don't get a vote on whether we bomb them. People in Mexico don't get a vote on whether we dam up the Rio Grande, right? And so like there's major impacts that a nation, an empire really of our size has on the whole world. And then we benefit. So like I think of Devin, you talked about serving our country. Um, people are serving our country all the time. Uh, including from outside our borders with the things that we benefit from, you know, all the, the food supply chains and various other supply chains that we're entirely dependent on come from outside of our borders. And so somehow we think that products can move across our borders freely, but the people who make them can't. And I think that's an absurdity that we really need to examine. 
Um, and so to kind of bring that into what can we do in Athens, a lot of this stuff I think is a mix of cultural shifts and federal level policies that need to change. Um, but certainly I feel committed to resisting anything that is rooted in viewing people as somehow different because of where they come from. Um, and, uh, you know, Athens turned away refugees under the previous administration, the Andrews administration. And that's something that I would hope we wouldn't repeat um, next time we're presented with the opportunity to give people refuge here. Um, and I also think we need to recognize the difference of the specific needs that people have in different communities and recognize that because of the context we have nationally, folks who live here and have immigrated from elsewhere have elevated needs and the public services we build out on the local level should probably be giving an elevated deference to the communities that need it most, which means reaching out a lot to immigrant communities. Um, and finally, breaking cycles in our participation in the prison industrial context. So a lot of a lot of what we hear about with the horrors of immigration right now is people in these cages, in these detention centers. And one of the best things we can do for people all over, regardless of their immigration status, is stop locking them in cages. And so that's how we approach policing and which things we decide to criminalize and decriminalize. And think on the local level. I just wanted to point to what I think are two great strengths of immigration. <clears throat> I mean, we are in a fundamental sense a, a land of immigrants. 2% of the population are Native Americans. 11% are involuntary immigrants, namely the African Americans who are descended from Africans who were brought involuntarily to the new world as slaves. And that leaves 87% of the population being either voluntary immigrants or descendants of, of voluntary immigrants. Now, I think a nation that is going to be truly democratic should be a nation of immigrants, meaning your political rights and all your rights should not in any way be tied to ancestry. We don't want to be a nation state in the sense of a, of a, a body politic whose identity is defined by the culturally given, historically given identity of a people. We want to be a nation that consists of people who are citizens because they are uh, recognizing a common constitution and who their parents were is besides the point uh, for their status as, as citizens. On the other hand, if we want our democracy to have impact in the world, we can't take Donald Trump's position and say America's full. Uh, you know, we, uh, before the civil war, we, were, we had about less than 30 million people by the turn of the 20th century, we've become the world's greatest economic power. We had about 100 million people. When I was born, we had 150 million people. Great Britain at that time had about, I think a little over 50 million people. Now we have 330 million. Britain has 65 million. You know, we have be continued to become this dominant power in large part because of our allowing human capital to flood into our nation to a degree that other nations have not allowed it. And we're now in a world where China, which has almost five times as many people as, as we do, and India, which has almost five times as many people as we do, you know, are, could be thought of as, as potentially gaining standards of living comparable to ours, which means they will have the resources for military establishments five times as large as ours, scientific development five times in magnitude as ours and so forth and so on. Do we want a world dominated by a one-party party dictatorship, if that's what China remains? Do we want a, a nation dominated by a world dominated by a nation that today is, is the world's largest democracy, India, but is ruled by Modi, who is India's Trump and faces a very divided opposition and is in the position of undermining democracy as it stands in, in India and turning it into an ethnically defined Hindu state. And if we are to maintain a just prominence in the world, we have to grow and we can grow through immigration. Uh, Donald Trump has actually succeeded in conjunction with the pandemic in completely shutting down immigration. There is no immigration taking place now. And I think immigration is good. We have room, we have a duty both under international and domestic law to let in anyone seeking asylum. They're entitled not to be stuck outside our borders where they have no access to, to legal representation to go through the process. We should let them in. They should not be detained. 
there's now a seven year waiting period for asylum seekers to get their cases filed. Instead of building a wall, we should vastly increase the number of, of officers dealing with asylum cases. Keep it within six months so that people can know where they stand. And, and likewise, obviously, we, we, we need to regularize the people who we've allowed to be here illegally. And I say we've allowed them because we haven't enforced the law. And we all know that employers have taken great advantage of them, very happily doing so, uh, knowing they can pay them less, give them less benefits, essentially treat them like garbage because they're in this netherworld. And of course, our policies abroad are, are responsible for millions of people from the South coming to our borders to escape criminal violence, which are or on drugs and our gun policies have largely unleashed by enriching the cartels and arming them to the teeth. Our economic policies with NAFTA, flooding what's south of our borders with uh, subsidized American products of agribusiness, destroying peasant agriculture and the like, right? We bear the responsibility for the destitution and the threat of death hanging over the heads of millions of people who are now striving to make it north. And I think we, we have to face our responsibility and be humane about it and welcome those who want to contribute to our country. Indeed. Yeah. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Actually, one audience member in particular has asked a few questions. Uh, so uh, thank you, Sylvia, for asking good questions. Um, I'll pose them and then I'd like to hear from Deborah first because I know Deborah needs to leave at 530 and then everybody else can, can chime in as you so please. Um, so the first question that Sylvia asked was, how do you feel about amnesty for the approximately 11 million undocumented people living here? And then the other question that Sylvia posed was, what should the future of ICE be? Um, what can we do about ICE on the state and local level? And how can we attract international students once again to our state? We've lost many in the last four years. So I'm happy to repeat any of those questions if y'all wanna hear them again. Uh, but. So Sylvia doesn't make it easy, does she? <laughs> those, <laughs> those Sylvia. Sets and Sylvia, trust me, we can have hour long conversations on each of them. Um, but to, to sort of put it into context, when I look at it from a public safety point of view, we did have amnesty before, right? And one of the reasons why the United States decided to do that was because of a safety issue. Because when we do not know who is here, it can set it up for some dangerous incidents, right? When we are demonizing immigrants, when they suffer and are victims of crime, they do not come and they do not report it because they are even too afraid to do that. And when that happens, that increases the violence and the trauma that's in our communities, you know? So yes, I do believe that an amnesty is a good thing because I believe it would actually make us safer in the long run. And what I will also say is that when you have an amnesty who usually comes forward into the process are mainly the people who have been working hard since the very beginning, right? If you've got somebody with a criminal element, they're not gonna go through this process because just because you say you have amnesty does not mean that there is not a process that needs to be followed so that they can get through and be able to then gain their citizenship. So it'll take time as well. As for the future of ICE, you know, ICE was created after 9-11. We did not have ICE, right? Um, before 9-11. And you know what, we didn't need it then. And I truly believe that we don't need it now. What we've done is we've criminalized people just trying to get a better life, you know? and. It's the same as what we've done with the police, with militarizing them, with giving them so much money that, that then they come into these, into these community thinking that they have absolutely all of the authority to do whatever they want, however they want to, whoever they want. You know, people know that I am Boricua. I, my family is from Puerto Rico. We are born citizens, but that hasn't stopped ICE from arresting us and putting us in the same detention centers that they put other undocumented um, immigrants 
just seeing us as Latino, right? Not understanding that we are US citizens um, and that we shouldn't be treated that way. When I first got to Athens and went to uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles to switch my license from New York to Georgia, the woman in front of me handed over a birth certificate from Puerto Rico. And the person in, in that window told her they couldn't accept it because it was from a foreign country. And I stepped in and I said, nope, it's not a foreign country. <laughs> it is, you know, territory of the United States. She is a US citizen, you know, and just a couple of years ago, we discovered that they had this special driver's test examination for people from Puerto Rico. And I went through the 40 questions. I didn't know those answers. First of all, some of those answers was like, who's the governor from 2005? You know, what does that have to do with driving a car? Okay, so I think there are some things there that we can fix. As for the loss of international students, and my husband works at UGA, I think this is felt so acutely in the university, especially because it is a research university that we've had this brain drain and people are just not coming. And when they think of the other options that they have, England, Canada, Australia, other English speaking countries that do not have the restrictions nor the cultural, right? animosity that we have in the United States. And they also have the financial assistance for those students in those countries that we do not have here. People can go, you know, even in Germany, you can go um, to higher education for free. And so what used to be the advantage of having an education in the United States is not there at the level that it was before. And it will not be there under this administration. And I think the first thing that we need to do in order to get more international students back is vote out this administration in November, okay? Because we need to regain our standing in the world. It has been, for lack of a better word, trumped right now. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, we don't have the respect that we used to have out there in the world. So why would people want to send their children to our country to be educated? It used to be a status level. It is not anymore. It is not anymore. I want to thank you guys. I'm going to um, head off, but thank you so much as always for such a great conversation. Sylvia, thank you for those questions. I'm sure you'll reach out to me and we can continue the conversation. Thanks and bye-bye everybody. Thanks, Deborah. Bye. Bye, Deborah. Appreciate you as always. Um, did you, oh, does anybody need uh, the, the questions repeated or you got them? Yeah, I got them right here. Um, it was uh, Amnesty ICE International Students. Um, hi, Sylvia. Um, so amnesty is uh, one of those words, it's a buzzword that has been used so many times in so many ways that it uh, lacks meaning in modern political parlance. Um, but if just simply defined as a direct path is, um, to citizenship or naturalization for the 11 million undocumented immigrants that exist in this country, then absolutely I'm supportive of it. Uh, we're existing, we're maintaining what amounts to an apartheid state where we have 11 million people who pay taxes um, who participate in our society, but are not able to fully participate in our society. Um, it costs the government a lot of money, um, and it also costs a lot of grief for them, and it's an unnecessary uh, status for them to exist under. Um, the, a lot of, you know, the things of, you know, they don't pay taxes, they exist on, they're, they're on welfare, and they're like, everything in our system, they do pay taxes. Um, every modern uh, social welfare is constructed specifically to exclude on um, not only just uh, undocumented immigrants, but oftentimes by virtue of that excluding family of undocumented immigrants, even though those children are uh, citizens of the United States. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, give a pathway to allow these people to become citizens because uh, for the most part, they're far better citizens than uh, some of the people that I've seen around the city, the, the state right now. Um, as far as ICE, yeah, I think it's, there's an argument to be made for having, you know, a, um, some kind of agency that handles immigration, but that that agency doesn't have to be a law enforcement agency. And I think that's something that Deborah touched on. 
um, you can definitely have an agency that handles immigration without it being an enforcement agency the way ICE is. Um, you can have it separate from the border patrol. You can have that as its own thing. And so once you start bringing all this in, you add an excessively criminal at kind of flavor to immigration. Um, so you're, and as we've seen with, you know, the modern state of police, uh, anything that's over criminalized is going to lead to some pretty bad results. Um, I mentioned earlier the issues that we're having with detention centers here in the state of Georgia. Um, I don't have as but much to say about attracting international students, but on a local level, I think that's really just come down to, I know Jesse mentioned that we rejected the offer, um, the uh, opportunity to accept re uh, refugees in the city. Uh, so I think, you know, really at a local level, the most we can do is make the city feel welcome, welcoming to immigrants and welcoming to everyone. I mean, I think that's something that's changing. I, I like to see in Athens and yeah, expect, um, from our university the same and expect not only for them to be welcoming because international students are paying more but also fostering a safe and welcoming campus environment that unfortunately does not exist here at UGA um, it can it's all right at times but for people of color there are still some unfortunate remnants of systemic racism that haven't been addressed by the university and if the university wants to take money from international students, then it also needs to address the problems with racism on campus. I'll uh, jump in and try to be brief and just say, how do I feel about amnesty? Yes, uh, absolutely. You know, as a general concept, the fact that there's something you need amnesty from is unjust laws in the first place. So, yep. Uh, the future of ICE, I would say, abolish ICE. Uh, there's no reason for us to continue to have this essentially Gestapo that uh, should not exist in this country. And um, so we might we need to get rid of it. Of course, between now and the total dismantling of that uh, institution, what can we do about ICE on a state and local level? Kind of just threw down some stuff that I generally threw under the umbrella of aggressive non-cooperation. Um, so that looks a bit like not sharing data with ICE, which is something that I'm really proud of John Q for being outspoken about against the incumbent and now also his opposition in this general election. Um, for people who don't know, the sheriff's department is usually where you're gonna be looking for those policies on the local level. The sheriff's departments are the ones who run the jails and they're the ones who are gonna have the most involvement in what we're doing in terms of cooperating or not with ICE. Um, also not hosting facilities. So you know, this is more a state level thing, but we don't need to have detention centers in Georgia. Um, most of these things are state level, um, but giving licenses to folks um, is another measure that we can take, you know, before we have full uh, naturalization and things like that. Um, we can also enfranchise for voting uh, residents on the local level and the state level, but that's something I'd like to see us do on the local level. Um, participatory budgeting is also a way to give people a say in some of how we're spending the money on the local level, even if they're not enfranchised to vote. Um, I also think it's important for us as leaders to be outspokenly opposed. And so even where we don't have formal power, passing resolutions um, in opposition to the existence of ICE, like bold resolutions, as well as resolutions in favor of the positive stuff we're looking for and in favor of immigrants in general, I'm really proud of what the mayor and commission passed uh, last year under the leadership of some of the progressive people we got elected in 2018. Um, and then I'll just reiterate reimagining public safety from the courts to the police to the prisons and you know, uh, what it is that we're criminalizing and how we're approaching people who we see as doing something that's regarded as criminal and, and really rethinking that, uh, which includes eliminating for-profit prisons and for-profit contracts, even in our public prisons um, with companies that are benefiting and profiting from and have an incentive to lock these folks in cages, the easiest of whom to lock in cages being poor folks and undocumented folks. Um, as far as what can we do to attract international students, it's not exactly my wheelhouse, but I imagine that a more welcoming society that does some of the stuff we're talking about would kind of organically attract folks. And uh, UGA and the University System of Georgia could certainly make a great stride by lifting the ban on undocumented people, which has been in place for years now. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll res should I respond? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I am in favor of, of giving an amnesty to all the undocumented. And I think there should be as short as possible a transition between having permanent residency and being able to become a citizen. 
Um, and regarding the abolition of ICE, I think to some degree that's a kind of empty, empty policy because we're still going to need some kind of agency to enforce our immigration laws. The question is, what are those laws and what will, what will be the manner of the enforcement? That's the key issue, not whether we call that issue, call that agency ICE or INS or whatever else. Uh, the same thing applies to the police, abolishing the police versus whatever we want to call the agency that's going to be dealing with our public safety and enforcing our laws. Uh, the question is, how does it operate and what are those laws? Now, I think there's one big issue that has been ignored so far. And, and that's the, the issue of the economic anxiety and, and the economic problems that um, it reflects that illegal immigration causes. Because there is this, I think this, I think um, delusional attitude that the, the work that is done by illegal immigrants is work that Americans don't want to do. Now it may not be the work that middle class or upper middle class Americans want to do, but it is work that has been done by Americans. And I, I think it's interesting to point to, to two examples of this. Back in the 1970s, the United Farm Workers under Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta actively were engaged in trying to get illegal immigrants exposed and deported because they were working in farms and under, undermining the pay and, and jobs of the farm workers who were mainly Chicanos in, in their areas who they were attempting to unionize. In Athens, for example, you know, we are surrounded by a bunch of chicken processing plants. Now these had been uh, places that had become employed, employing um, pretty much entirely African-Americans. The employers eventually replaced them with uh, Hispanics and, and a good number of undocumented workers. And then when these workers became terrorized by ICE and Trump's policies, they left. African-Americans have returned to these jobs. Um, I think if we really wanna have an amnesty, we have to accompany it with measures that ensure that providing legal status and increasing immigration is not gonna jeopardize anyone's livelihood. And to do that, we need a federal job guarantee, which will ensure that anyone who can find a job will be offered a job by the government at a fair wage starting at $20 and up, that we have full employee empowerment so that workers can successfully fight for decent wages and working conditions, which requires pretty much automatic unionization as well as seats on corporate boards. And I think if we have these kind of measures in place, we remove that kind of anxiety that has led to a lot of the villainization of immigrants and that has fomented the rise of fascist movements in the United States and in many countries abroad that are being inundated by immigrants, including those nations that are run by social Democrats that have health care for everyone, that have free college, that have all sorts of benefits, but do not have guaranteed jobs. And people are worried about losing their jobs. And they're turning their, their fears on the waves of asylum seekers and others. And I think if we're going to have the amnesty, we have to accompany it with economic security for everyone, guaranteed. All right. Well, the, uh, the bad thing about going last after being on a panel with such brilliant people is that they've already said everything. The good thing about it is that this will be very short. So when it comes to amnesty, I don't like that word at all. Amnesty uh, makes you think that there is something that someone did that was wrong that they are now being pardoned for. And I do not want to uh, vilify our uh, DACA um, re recipients here who who have done nothing wrong. And so, you know, I'm, I'm okay with, you know, giving them legal status. That's great. Giving them amnesty is misleading. Um, also, what was that second question about ICE? Um, like I said, brilliant people on the panel. Uh, Deborah already said it. We didn't need them before. We don't need them now. They were uh, put in place mainly to combat terrorism, but also to enforce immigration law. But they have 
widely moved away from the anti-terrorism and are, I, I don't know the specific number, I'm just gonna throw something out there, but 90% focused on immigration. Um, and I'll say it one more time, Deborah already said it, we didn't need it before, we don't need it now. And then uh, as far as how do we get international students again? First thing we need to do is vote President Trump out of office. And then we need to regain our standing on the world stage, regain uh, the trust of other nations um, and uh, regain our clout as being somewhere that international students can come to actually learn and be safe because you know a lot of things happen um, a lot of these protests and and everything you know they happen on campuses too and so let's not only think about you know them not thinking that we're worthy of coming to anymore but are they going to be safe that's probably something that's deep in their minds when they're contemplating whether or not they're going to come here uh, uh, to go to school that's it thanks for that um, does anybody have anything to respond to another candidate on something they've said, or should we move on to the next question? Next question. I just might want to add to, to what, what Devin was mentioning regarding safety of, of students, foreign students, and, and one could say immigrants in general. Is it, you know, all of our security agencies admit that the greatest domestic terrorist threat in the United States are white supremacists organizations, militia, I, I, I consider them really fascist organizations. And you know, the government is not really paying due attention to them. I mean, if, if people are to feel safe in this country, we've got to deal with that domestic terrorist threat and root it out. And the government and the Justice Department has to take a leading role in doing that. And then foreign, well, immigrants and foreign students and the population at large can feel safer if that's done. Well, I might go ahead and I might go so far as to say that ICE is an example of that fascist, violent, racist institution. And I hesitate to understand how we could build from it as it is uh, a meaningfully compassionate and useful to the kinds of values that I think we share on this call uh, institution. So I, I stand by my wanting to abolish ICE, but we can save that argument for another time. I do. Uh, I did want to ask this, this thing about amnesty. Uh, I appreciate a variety of folks kind of pushing against that term being a particularly useful one. And, um, you know, thinking of it as if we grant people amnesty, we're also sort of saying, well, you did this wrong thing. I guess I'm curious if anybody who's watching wants to follow up on their take on that. And I'm also curious if you wanted to elaborate, Zachary, as a um, as a lawyer, you know, like what the utility of that term is, or if it's actually maybe one we should get away from, because you kind of alluded to that. Great question. Uh, I'm not yet a lawyer, uh, so we got, got a little time yet. But um, yeah, I think Deborah seemed to, she was a little more familiar with it. But uh, from what I know, I think, yeah, it's the idea that it's uh, similar like, to a pardon or just, you know, like general amnesty is saying, you know, this group of people did something and we're not going to hold it against them. And allow them to get through. I think there's um, one of the reasons that it is kind of this does have validity is um, I don't know how many people know, but whenever you do apply for naturalization or any kind of immigration process, something as simple as a parking ticket or a, um, a traffic violation can prevent you from moving forward in that process. So like you have to get waivers and usually they're fine as long as, you know, like nothing else is wrong. Um, so like, I guess like maybe it'd be a good term to say, you know, we're going to generally, uh, you know, pardon these kind of things, these minor violations. Uh, the reason that I just, it's, I don't like the term isn't because I disagree with its uh, necessarily its, its use. Um, it, especially like is it applied just like legally uh, undocumented, you know, it is illegal. They have illegally immigrated. I, I don't agree with that as a policy. I don't like that as a law, but that's the kind of the structure. So I understand the use of amnesty there. The reason I don't like using it just generally is the term has been used uh, to say anything remotely positive of opening up our immigration system. Um, and it's just a scare word at this point. Um, I think one thing that Republicans are really good at is dominating um, the kind of framing of issues 
And when it comes to amnesty, anytime, anything remotely, it, like if you're proposing new immigration plans, you have to clearly say, this is not amnesty. If you want to have any chance of it getting done. Um, so that's more, it's just a kind of political game and shit reason. I don't want to use it. Um, but also I did want to clarify, it's not that I'm against abolishing ICE. Um, I, yeah, I completely agree. It's, you know, that's once it's a system so rotten to the core, you do have to just get rid of it and start over. Um, I think we should abolish DHS. Um, DHS was only ever going to end up a Gestapo type organization. Um, if it's not there yet, it'll be there eventually. Um, the idea of federal policing is a relatively modern one. And we used uh, the tragedy of September 11 and the following to terrorist attacks to create a massive infrastructure of federal policing. And as we saw in Portland and around the country, that has a real danger of being used as a, you know, president's personal police force. And that's problematic. So get rid of DHS, not just ICE. The whole department needs to go. Uh, Secretary of State, they're fine. They can handle it. Like we have other departments that did that job before then. So, yeah. 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 And, and so what I would say more just like the, I, I appreciate the idea of having a, an immigration agency that's important and handles immigration issues and it might have a law enforcement wing the real problem with ICE to me is that it's the immigration agency and it's just all law enforcement that's how they view the whole thing and it's like it's the idea of um it's the same way that we look at policing now you know if everything is a, if you're a hammer and you know if everything is every tool is a hammer every problem is a nail so ICE is the hammer and anything involving immigration is a nail. And the problem is that immigration is not that simple at all. Um, so to clarify a couple of things. I would, um, I would also like to point out that um, a, another word that I don't like to use is, so you will have, you can have a group of black men dressed in all red or all blue, and they may not be armed at all. And they're a gang. And then you'll have a group of Hispanic uh, people who um, are hanging out together. They've got their, their pants hanging low and they've got these big old shirts on and they may not even be doing anything, but they are regarded as a gang. But then you have white men who are heavily armed, not sanctioned by anyone, and we call them a militia. <laughs> Where, that, that's just wrong. Uh, a, they are not uh, a military force that has been sanctioned to, to, um, to supplement our military. They are a gang, a violent, extreme gang. Just wanted to point that out. And they're actually illegal in Georgia. Um, not they're, the militia that is mentioned in the Second Amendment, it refers to state militias. Uh, the idea being that you should all citizens should be well armed in order to form a state militia at a moment's notice. notice. Um, and that's kind of just kind of an accepted idea of what militia means. Um, and uh, so we have militias that exist in this state that have, you know, the same to what Richard pointed out is that we just don't pay attention to them. Um, I think I, I think we all appreciate why the current administration does not focus on white terrorism and these militias. Um, and I think that no clearer example can be found in that a uh, current Republican candidate for Congress is using 3% militias, escorts, um, and so, and literally brown shirts. So yeah, I think we're very understanding why the current administration doesn't focus on white terrorism. But yeah, I like, and to Devin's point, you know, it's um, the really distinction of saying, okay, this is a gang and this is not a gang. Um, is the color of someone's skin. Uh, you can walk into downtown Athens and see a whole bunch of white people dressed all the exact same. No one's ever gonna refer to those people as a gang, even though they also have very colorful pastel shirts and khaki shorts. <clears throat> one thing I just wanted on to- village. What, One thing I just wanted to, to point to, since you brought up militia and they're armed, is you know if you think back on the second amendment, it sort of, rationalizes um, people being able to bear arms so that there can be a militia which allows the country to defend itself. Well, our country is not defended by a militia. It's, it's defended by a standing army that protects our democracy because it's under civilian control. 
So the entire justification of the Second Amendment is completely, let's say, obsolete. And uh, alas, it was Scalia and his decision in Heller, I think, that ignored the true meaning of the Second Amendment. And I'm afraid this new likely appointee to the Supreme Court is going to perpetuate. You mean to tell me that there's political bias and originalism and textualism? Of course not. Scalia just read the definition. And yeah, that's, it just means that, of course. Yeah, so yeah, that's uh, it's, it's valid. Uh, Heller is the reason that we have the current state of things now. Um, and you're right, second minute is uh, obsolete. Um, but uh, I guess we need maybe want to return to immigration. Uh, I know that sure, sure, sure. <laughs> we can probably have an entire other thing on second amendment. Um, I'll, and I would actually really enjoy seeing those opinions because I imagine we uh, have differing ones. Um, but I know that uh, someone asked a couple more questions on the website or on the on Facebook. True. Uh, we do have a question from Sajata, uh, Richard's wife, who uh, is an immigration lawyer, right? Right, Richard? Yes. She is. Um, she, I, I don't know if I fully understand the, the question, but maybe you all will. Uh, she asks, what is the current policy on ICE detainers? I think that's more of a, that'd be a better question for the sheriff, uh, but Jesse may be more, more familiar with how Athens does it locally. Yeah, so currently um, my understanding is the sheriff's department is not honoring the detainer requests, but they were until a lot, and they, and they, they had been, there were multiple promises made to the community and specifically like immigrant activist groups in town and, and immigrant residents in town who had been organizing that they wouldn't cooperate. And then they began cooperating without notifying anybody. And then people found out and there was a big outcry and a lot of public pressure. They ceased cooperating again, as I understand it. Now, of course, all of this reveals that it's kind of difficult to, halt, to hold the office of the sheriff accountable because they are their own constitutional officer and they don't have any built-in means of oversight. Really. They, don't, they don't really have to reveal very much. Um, my understanding is that the current policy is that they're not honoring those detainers anymore. Um, which is something that John Q has um, explicitly committed to continuing as well as I think maybe going a bit further. And uh, the ability of the sheriff to do that and those kind of things is also really important um, to bring back to the state level. Um, my campaign really started a lot on focusing on the independence of local municipalities and local governments from state preemption. And one of the biggest kind of focuses of state preemption across the country has been uh, banning sanctuary cities um, to varying levels of success and degrees. Um, and I think you know, there's a general ban of them in Georgia, um, but what it necessarily means, I don't think it's a very well-defined statute, but like in Arizona and Florida and some other places, they are clearly defined statutes that actually place uh, personal liability on the commissioners and people who enact those laws. Um, and since the sheriff is a constitutional office, the only body that could potentially prevent a sheriff from uh, making the decision to not cooperate with ICE is this um, state legislator. So it's, we have um, a need, obviously for a variety of reasons, and immigration is just another one, of having progressive and liberal um, leadership in the legislature because they can do a lot of damage to any kind of attempt locally or federally to improve our immigration system. So uh, if, if anybody has more responses to that, that's fine. I just wanna put out there that we're getting close to our end time of six o'clock and I would be interested to hear from each of you what your number one issue regarding immigration would be, what your main, like your favorite thing that you would like to do if you got into the office that you're running for uh, regarding immigration, like what's your, what's the thing you're going to push for? Well, <clears throat> I'll start since I, I think the solutions have to be national. They can't really be handled on the state level. And I think we do have to provide legal status to, to everyone who's been here for more than a year and provide a quick route to citizenship so that people are not deprived of political freedom. But I think it also has to be com combined with measures that ensure that everyone's livelihood will be 
um, be unendangered by any increase in immigration or by any legalization we have. And that requires above all, a job guarantee that wipes out unemployment and poverty income. I think those things have to go together. All right, I guess I'll go next. Um, I would like to just remind everyone, everyone out there who is thinking that none of these uh, uh, undocumented immigrants should be receiving uh, any type of legal status. Um, those of you who uh, may be of the Republican persuasion and who are depending on your leaders, on your leadership to give you the honest truth about how things are in this country. Um, you are being told right now in 2020, ever since 2015 actually, that uh, that immigration is not a good thing that uh and that anyone who is here now illegally should be sent home I want to remind you that this is this is something that has happened under a president a, a trump republican party and i would just like to remind you that in the 80s under a reagan republican policy or republican administration they granted amnesty to 2.9 million undocumented immigrants. Um, the GOP like to deal in fear, um, not F-A-I-R, but F-E-A-R, fear. And that fear they have found has been a great motivator to get folks to the polls to vote for them, even when those things that they are pushing as something to be fearful of either do not exist or are not worthy of your fear. Obviously, Ronald Reagan believed that it was a good policy. And I dare say he is uh, one of the uh, greatest Republican presidents in our, uh, in our time. And so I would like to remind you that just because the people you are looking up to right now are telling you something is so, does not necessarily mean that it is. And so I, I beg of you to, uh, I say this all the time, do your own research. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not a, a fan so to speak, of Ronald Reagan Doris policies. But as Republican presidents go, he's one of the best that we've had. So uh, so yeah, just, just keep that in mind, 2.9 million. Um, I, I think that's it for now. I think I'm, I think I'm done. I guess I can uh, jump in here and, and say that what I've heard from Dia, uh, Dignidad Immigrante in Athens, um, which is a, a pretty powerful organization that's uh, built up here in Athens over the past handful of years, um, is, you know, licenses are their number one demand right now. Licencias hoy, papeles mañana. Uh, and and so I think standing with them to advocate for that, even though that's not a local level decision that we're empowered to make is important. And so maybe passing an additional resolution that specifically mentions that would be helpful. Um, and as far as something that we do have purview over, um, translation, um, you know, Spanish being the, the first place that we really need to put uh, a lot of that effort in, in Athens is another thing that I've heard them talk about. And, you know, so that, the activities of the local government are very inaccessible to a lot of the immigrant community um, because of the, the language that they're in being only English. So, um, so that's what I've heard from them as, as the top things they'd like to see. Um, and in, in general, I would consider my top priorities moving forward to be whatever I'm hearing from 
groups in town that are made up predominantly of immigrants, including and especially you. I'm going to try and keep this short, but I'm not going to be successful at all. Um, to Jesse's point of licenses, that's actually something that's happened across the country. Um, it's really cool. Uh, one of the things that I was working on at the clinic that I was in with the at UJ Law right before lockdown was something similar, but a municipal ID. Um, so the problem with licenses, uh, one, they have been brought up, but uh, my opponents among the people that have voted against them. The issue is there's a fear and it has been realized of ICE using the information of those licenses to track down undocumented immigrants. Because if you're going to use licenses and get, provide licenses to undocumented immigrants, and there are a lot of benefits to that, of uh, giving them insurance, having less um, unlicensed people driving on the roads, there's a lot of benefits. The danger is that if you're gonna give licenses out because that's a an official form of ID, you have to clearly state on the license that the person like it's not a voting license um and you would have to so then you would have to know that that person's undocumented um and then the fear would be that if you have a crazy to think of here in georgia a um racist administration that set threatens to take people back to the border themselves and cooperates with ice they could use that information to get to undocumented immigrants um so that's it's a double-edged sword there's a lot of benefits there's a lot of reasons to fight for it but any law that does do that would have to make it explicitly clear within the law that they could not be used for any kind of um, that that information couldn't be used for any kind of immigration enforcement. Um, you can prevent it, but it has to be very you have to be very cognizant of that as you move forward. That um, we can it would be great. Uh, I think the thing my original idea of what I was going to do is I was going to say a favorite and then like a kind of like pet project that I'd really like to see. It's kind of something interesting. And I think it's uh, important, to, interesting to try. Um, my thing that I think we definitely need to do is reject and kick out any detention center, immigration detention center in the state of Georgia. Um, there's no reason that in, this is not a hotbed of immigration. We're not on a border. We're not on a coast. Like no one's immigrating directly to Georgia. Um, shy of people that potentially you can make an argument for having you know since uh hartsville jackson such a large airport there might need to be some kind of detention center of immigrants or trafficking or anything through hartsville jackson beyond that there's no reason to have any kind of detention center in georgia and we've seen the problems with having them here and those problems are not accidental they're very intentional um so get rid of those that's something that it, i think is doable and it's what i want to do uh, my little pet project kind of stems from the municipal ID projects we just I mentioned. We were looking into potentially extending um, voting rights to immigrants. So in the state of Georgia, you are not allowed, uh, it's constitutional to not, that you can have to be a citizen, 18 years old, and so on to vote. Um, at a local level, I would, I would maintain that there's no difference between an, a citizen and a non-citizen. Um, now you could have a discussion about undocumented or, un or documented, but you know, undocumented immigrants as well as legal immigrants are paying the exact same taxes that you're paying at a local level. And they are sending their kids to the same exact school system. And they have every right to participate in the, to, in the local governance. Um, I don't think, I, I think, you know, you draw the line at local, um, you don't extend that to state or federal, but if a local government wants to extend, has a significant immigrant population, then it's not okay that only that they're excluded from the political process, even though they're extremely affected by it. Um, so I think just removing that one little line from uh, the constitution, having an amendment that removes citizen. Also, I think there's an argument for removing the age requirement and allowing middle school and high school students to vote for boards of education. Um, but that's a different topic. Uh, that'd be kind of a fun pet project, I think. So yeah, here we go. All right, if uh, you don't mind, I um, I actually didn't answer your question. <laughs> I was talking about uh, about those 2.9 million in, in, in the 80s, but um, I have, I guess, similar to Zachary, I have a, uh, um, a number one issue, and then also a, I, I hesitate to call it a, a side project because it's, it's important to me, but my number one issue would be um, reforming our H1 and H2 visa programs. Um, getting that straight so that we can, I mean, our economy could 
could flourish if we had if our farmers uh, had the uh, the the, the, the workers that they needed. Um, my other project would be what I mentioned at the very beginning, which is looking out for our veterans who have been deported. Um, so both of those are very important to me and, uh, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to tackling those. Thank you all. Uh, these are very thoughtful proposals. I'm very excited to see you uh, push them through. Um, all right, I, it is it is six o'clock, so we can we can wrap up here if y'all are good. You can give some kind of closing remark if you like, but mostly it'd be great if you could tell people again who you are, where they can read more about you, and what you're running for and why. So let's see. We'll go with Devin Pandy. Do you want to tell us who you are, what you're running for? Yes, I am. Once again, I am Devin Pandy. I am the Democratic nominee running for United States House of Representatives uh, to represent the uh, Georgia's ninth congressional district in uh, in the U.S. Congress. You can learn more about me and my platform at devinpandyforcongress.com. And, uh, oh, there was something I wanted to say. What was it? Oh, yes. Um, I actually, I, I said this on the, on the just on the fly the other night. And then I said it again on our last uh, um, A4E extras. And, um, and I, I wanna keep repeating it as, as much as I can. Uh, vote, go out and vote. It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, what your gender is, what community you belong to, it doesn't matter. Um, if you've been told that you shouldn't vote or that you can't vote, um, but you actually can, vote. And uh, what I said that I would like to keep repeating is that some of you who may look like me or who may have uh, uh, come from a, a similar background may not think that you can vote. But if I can run, you can vote. Please vote. Sorry, got my buttons crossed for a second. You want to go, Zach? Yeah, yeah, I gotta, I gotta run. So I'll just go ahead and quickly. Cool. Um, my name is Zachary Perry. I am the Democratic nominee for Georgia State Senate. That's the office I'm running, uh, District 46. Uh, so if you live inside the Loop in Athens or like Town West. Uh, of Athens or in a county or Walton County, you can vote for me. Uh, if you don't, you can still do one very specific favor, uh, which is not only to what Devin said, which is go out and vote, but ask every single person that you see if they have voted. Um, it's very simple. Don't have to be rude about it. Don't have to ask them who they voted for, but just ask them, have you voted yet? And if they said yes, congratulate them. If they say no, encourage them to do so. Um, I have done that. I've been doing this for about a week and a half and I've received nothing but positive responses. Everybody's excited. Um, there's a feeling in the air that there's something about to happen and I'm really excited to see what it is. And so encourage people to vote, go out and vote yourselves. If you want to know more about me, uh, my website is perryforgeorgia.com. My, uh, I have a Facebook page. I got a Twitter, H hit me up on any of those. Please reach out to me. I love talking politics if you can't tell. So, um, Look forward to hearing from people. And we got, I think it's 19 days now. So we're, we're closing in y'all. And um, another last minute thing I did wanna mention, be prepared and get everyone else around prepared to not know the results of the election for a week after the election. I think that's something that we all kind of realize, but we're not making enough noise about. Um, we're used to instant results. We're not gonna get them this year, accept that. And let's get ready for it. Um, because I think it's just be, it'd be nice to have just a week of, I can't do anything. I'm just gonna wait for everything to flow in. Have a nice day, y'all. Thank you for having me. Thanks, uh, Aaron, for holding this and for Athens for everyone for us and these. Thanks guys. Look forward to seeing you again. Bye, Zach. Thank you. Take care, Zach. Good luck. All right, we have two left vying for the last spot to speak. Uh, Richard, you wanna go next? 
Okay, I'll leave Jesse the last word. Um, <clears throat> I'm Richard Dean Winfield. Again, I'm running for the US Senate in Georgia's special election. And this, of course, is an extremely important race because the real solutions to our problems require national answers. And that's particularly true of immigration reform. And it, obviously this is an important election. Everyone must make it to the polls in one way or another, but you have to be informed when you get there. Because if you don't know who you're voting for or what they stand for, your, your vote is empty. So I urge you to find out about my job guarantee social rights agenda on my campaign website, winfieldforsenate.com. Listen to my podcast, America Unchained. If you can bear it, read my latest book, Democracy Unchained. I think it, it's important to recognize that if we're going to have comprehensive immigration reform, we have to make it work so that it benefits everyone as it should. And that requires that everyone's social rights be recognized and upheld. Everyone who is a resident, irrespective of their status, should be recognized, have a right to a job at fair wages, a right to healthcare, a right to education at all levels, a right to decent housing, a right to food and, and a right to, um, as I said, edu education at all levels and legal representation at all levels. And that applies to everyone, whether or not you are documented or not. Go to the polls and, and make this come true. Thanks. All right, Jesse, last word. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll piggyback on what people are talking about with this get out the vote discussion and say that I think it's really important when you, if you've already voted, try to find a few people to ask and see if they voted. And if they say yes, try to encourage them, you know, benefits sometimes to that pyramid scheme approach that I think are really, uh, really important. Um, phone trees, if you will. So, you know, think of three people you can call and then encourage them to think of three people. And it's not just about asking people to vote and are they planning to vote, but talk through their plan with them. How are you planning to vote and when? We have a massive amount of early voting opportunities here in Clark County if you're voting in Clark County and there's early voting happening all over the state. Um, Athens for Everyone I know is a resource for that on the Clark County website. You can also go to my website, jesseforathens.com slash info and get the breakdown of all the different places you can drop your ballot off if you wanna do the absentee ballot, but hand deliver it to not worry about postage, as well as uh, all the different information for different early voting locations. Uh, I'm highly recommending people vote early when possible because it doesn't matter where you live, you can vote early and you don't have to worry about precincts, whereas day of you do. Uh, and also now that we've gotten through this first week, as the hours expand and then the locations expand, the lines should also be quite short. So it's a good opportunity to to not have to wait a long time and to vote safely in person. And those ballot drop boxes are a really, really great place to hand deliver it, to not worry about the post office. Please, if you're voting uh, with the absentee ballots, make sure to fill your circles in all the way, use blue or black ink and use the double envelopes. Those are all things that are potentially going to get in the way of people's ballots being counted or the votes on them being counted, as well as making sure that your signature matches what you have on your ID. So. Uh, with all those sort of PSAs out of the way, uh, my name is Jesse Hool. I'm in the special election for District 6 of Clark County Commission. And if you want to learn even more about me, you can go to the website, jesseforathens.com, J-E-S-S-E for Athens.com. You can email me at jesseforathens at gmail.com, or feel free to call or text me at 706-395-5029. And since I'm going last, I feel like I would be remiss to not give a shout out to Mocha Jasmine Johnson, Deborah Gonzalez and John Q. Williams, all of whom couldn't be on the call or had to leave early today, but are fantastic candidates. If you live in my district, you can vote for all three of them as well. So John Q. Williams for Sheriff, Mocha Jasmine Johnson for State House, and Deborah Gonzalez, who had to leave this call early for District Attorney. Uh, much love, y'all. Thanks a lot to y'all for joining and Aaron and Athens for everyone for hosting. Thank you so much. Thanks the whole panel, everybody who could show up and people who have showed up previously, just as Jesse said. Um, we appreciate each and every one of you giving us your time when you can. We know you're super busy and you're working hard for the people. So thank you guys. And uh, thanks everybody who tuned in, people who asked questions. And um, I think we'll try to do one of these again another time, maybe even after an election, right? Like Richard suggested that and it sounded great. So more conversations to come, but get out and vote. Thanks y'all.